So, hello, um, I'm Ben Donnelly Science. I'm the Archaeological Archives Curator at the new North Hampshire Archaeological Resource Centre. And thank you for allowing me to come and speak about what we've been doing um, with our new facility and how, how we got there and what we've been doing for the first year. Um, so, first, before we start, um, let's just talk about what we actually do. Um, so, we are located at the Chester House Estate, which is in Erchester, just outside Wellingborough in Northamptonshire. Um, the Chester House Estate is a heritage attraction and also an events venue um, with commercial activity. And the idea is all the commercial activity that happens on the site um, makes the um, the Ark, uh, well, I'll say the Ark, the Northamptonshire Archaeological Resource Centre, I'll just say the Ark. Um, and we have an on-site excavation exp um, that we run with the University of Leicester, a learning program. The idea is all the commercial activity from the events and stuff makes that sustainable. Um, we are the new um, central um, county repository for archaeological archive for Northamptonshire. So we collect for both North Northamptonshire, of which we are a part of, and we also collect for West Northamptonshire, who also partly funds the, um, the store. Um, it's a climate-controlled facility built specifically just for archaeological materials. So we don't have to share our collections with social history or geology or art. We are just for archaeology, which is um, really handy. Um, and we have space for up to about 30,000 boxes. Um, but we do have space to, for future as well, so we can move around things and actually get more space. And most importantly, it's about free public access for our collections. So anybody can come in, whether um, they are a person who's just interested in their local history, a person who's just curious about what was underneath their, um, found underneath their houses in new housing development, all the way through to PhD students, academics, anyone is welcome to come and access our collections. Um, so I should probably just go into a bit of a background um, of why this building was needed to be built. So um, it's been a long time coming. I think the earliest planning document about this, um, we opened in 2021, I think was from uh, 2002. So um, it's been a very long time coming. North Ants as a county, I think was one of the first counties in the country, if not the first, to run out of space. Kent might have beat us, I think. Um, but we have no, we've had no space for archaeological material to be collected since 1999. And really, it's been since the 80s, because um, there have been major excavations in the counties from the 80s onwards, where just, it's been left all over the place. Um, and that's also had the knock-on effect that North Ants has been largely missed out of national research projects. People haven't been able to access the collections, because the stores were, some of the stores were accessible, but most of them were not. So it's just meant that People won't access collections they don't know how to get to. So North Ants, it has actually got some really interesting history. It's not just somewhere on the way to other places. Um, but no one's been able to actually look at that. So, um, and as this, here you can see, I'm sure many of you have seen stores like this in the past. Um, but we had four, four stores a bit like this. Um, so this is a, a lockup basically in Daventry. Um, we'd also had stuff that was essentially um, stored in agricultural barns, um, stuff that was in a condemned building in Northampton where it leaked from the ceiling onto all the documentary archives. Um, yeah, stores with my source sorts. It's been, it's been a bit fun. Um, so, I started in 2019, so I'll do just a very quick thing before I started. Um, the Ark was made part of the Chester Farm, which then became Chester House Project. Um, this is it under construction. This is what the building looked like beforehand. Um, and there was multiple so, um, scoping studies of the archives that took place to kind of get an idea of how much was out there. We'll come on to that in a bit. Um, the first version of the North Ants Archaeological Archive standards were created, so um, units, uh, archaeological units working in the county had a set set of standards, um, though I'm sure some of the units, people from units in the county who work in the county who were in the room will say there were some issues with them in places. <laughs> um, and um, the building was, I took the job in 2019, Two weeks before, uh, two weeks after I accepted the job, the builders who were building this building went bust. So um, I still took it because it was a great opportunity. You know, I wasn't going to ever get another opportunity to start an archaeological archive store from scratch. So um, I stuck with it. So um, in 20, from 2019 to mid 20, uh, 2021, uh, we procured, well, it wasn't me, it was a colleague of mine, procured a new building contractor to finish off the ark, but also the rest of the Chester House estate. Um, and I went around and visited all of the legacy stores um, that were out there. So I visited about six or seven of the main archaeological units of stored material, the five or so um, major stores where some of them had up to 5,000 boxes of archives in, 
just to kind of get an idea of what the scale was, any issues, um, and establishing those conservation issues, of which we'll come on to this plenty. Um, and writing the policy document. So this is the updated version of our um, archive standards, um, which we um, put in fees and um, also kind of just made it useful for units to actually deposit. Um, I stole lots of different other counties' ideas, so I've probably plagiarised half of your stuff. Um, so, and then we integrated, and this was really important, integrating our processes closely with our planning colleagues, um, who the county archaeologists. Um, so um, that was essentially making sure that all of our archives we have a HDR event number for, so we can link the two main data sets for archaeology in the county, our archaeological archives and the historic environment record. So that's been crucial, and also it's been trying to get people to actually deposit with the ADS. When I started, in the original guidelines, there were about, I think, eight depositions with the ADS for North Ants, and we're now up to 67 or something like that. So there's been a big improvement, and that has been primarily because of our planning, my planning colleagues pestering units to deposit, which has been really useful. Um, and then I selected a database. Um, I went around several places in the country, and we settled on EMU, which we stole from Bristol Museums. Thank you. Um, and we made some changes to, to fit our collections, because obviously Bristol Museums has a huge range of different types of collections, whereas we just um, store boxes of old archaeology. Um, and we purchased lots of supplies because we knew we were going to need it. Um, so there were some problems. There was this thing called COVID that happened, and um, that was somewhat of an issue. And um, the, because of the builders going bust, that meant the building took longer to uh, be deposited. I'm sure some of you in this room who wanted to deposit archives with North Ants, you're probably waiting about 10 years from when you were first told to do it. Yeah, I've seen nodding heads. Um, when we did the scoping study, when the scoping studies were done, I was meant to inherit around about 15,000 boxes of archives. Um, we actually have got around about 23, 24,000 boxes of archives, so it was really different. Um, and they also missed out all of the big objects. So this room here, um, this is uh, in one of Historic England's buildings. These are, well, some of um, 17 partially complete Roman mosaics, the biggest of which is three, and a half, three meters by two and a half meters, which was never factored into the build. And luckily, we just had space for it. Um, but there's also huge bits of stonework, and no, none of that was ever, ever really looked at. Um, so we can fit it all, so that's good. But it does mean that um, some of our future proof, and we'll make to have space for 25 years, we probably don't have space for 25 years now. And also, there was the scale of the conservation issues. So this is an archive. Um, you might be able to see this nice bits of black mold on it, and um, white mold as well. And um, this was a lot of what we were inheriting, was archives that looked like that, archives in you know, whiskey boxes, veg trays, all sorts of things. So we know that we need to re-box and re uh, uh, repackage around about 14,000 boxes in our collection, which is something around about 60%. So quite a lot of stuff to do. Um, and that's primarily because it's not been stored very well in the past. And we also have very limited cataloging. Of the legacy stores, really only one of them had cataloging that was really fit for purpose. So essentially, we are having to start that all from scratch. So the good news is we, start, we actually opened in October 2021. And so I'm going to cover what we did, have done for the last um, year or so. And um, but this is a nice picture. These are some of our volunteers and also people. Um, people from Jamie Briggs Removals who moved about 9,000 boxes to the store in about two weeks, and our volunteers were unloading it. So we'll cover our volunteers, the collections work that we've done, and public access. So, starting with our volunteers, um, I should just say our volunteers have been absolutely amazing. I can't really understate how great they've been. And we've got one of them in the room, which is great. Um, so we went out and we were trying to, went out to recruit volunteers and we had over 200 people who signed up to help. Um, so I was expecting when we started this, maybe about 50, but there was a huge public interest. It's actually getting close to 300 people who have been, who have been interested in helping. Of those, because I'm the only member of staff, we've only had the capacity to reach about uh, 75 of them. We do tell them in advance that we have only limited opportunities, but people are still very happy to just sign up. And um, we did just do a, a sort of a survey out to see how many of those still want to volunteer, and pretty much all of them still want to volunteer, which is really good. But 
of those 75, they have contributed over uh, 3,500 hours worth of time. Um, so they have a real range of experience. Um, some, like this lady on the end, um, who is Carmel, she's brilliant. Um, she's been doing excavations on and off in the county as a, a part of community archaeology group for 40 years. Carol, who's next to her. Um, this is actually a picture from our excavation. I can't take good photos, so I had to find someone, another photo of our volunteers looking happy. But Carol had about 10 years' experience working with archaeological material. But the vast majority, I'd say 80% of our um, volunteers, have had no prior experience working with archaeological material, either as part of an archaeological group or um, working with other museums. Um, so, but that's been great because we've been able to kind of just introduce people to what the amazing resource archaeology can be. And our volunteers have been heavily involved throughout all of the work that we do. So there's been a lot of moving boxes um, because we've basically had to move the whole store around three times depending on when things have been coming in. Um, but also there have been washing finds. We found um, assemblages of material that haven't been washed ever. So excavations in the 1960s that needed to be washed. Human remains, it was really good fun. Um, they smelt really bad. And, um, yeah, repackaging finds, um, which we'll come on to a bit. Um, cataloging, so, um, and then also leading tours. And that's been crucial. We've had a group of nine volunteers who have been leading tours. And as I said, they're all brilliant. I'm not just saying that because I'm here, but they really are just amazing. Um, so, to the collection standpoint, um, we, this picture is a nice like, sort of before and after. This is how this is how some human remains arrived at our store, and um, we've had a group of volunteers working on human remains. These, the labels aren't finished, but this is how it should end up. I went around the store trying to find if I could. This isn't staged. This is actually how it was, and I just went around the store yesterday trying to see if I could find somewhere um, where it could show both. Um, so we've moved around 16,500 boxes of archives to the store. Um, so we've still got around yeah about. So about 8,000 left, so there's still quite a bit more to come. Um, and we are currently undertaking a rapid catalogue. So this is essentially a spreadsheet because currently the, o the only person who knows roughly where things are in the, ha in, the, in the place is me. So if I got hit by a bus, we would have some real problems. So we are essentially just filling in a spreadsheet, taking the boxes largely at what they have, what they say they have in them at face value, checking those that have basically nothing on them, of which there are plenty. Um, but it's just so, so we know what's on what shelves, because otherwise we would not be able to find anything for a researcher. It's not the best way that we could do it, and we will be doing a far more detailed catalogue as we actually come to repackage things, but we just needed something so we actually had a baseline of what is in the store. Um, we've repackaged around about 800 boxes of archives. Um, there's probably about 4,000 boxes of uh, material that probably should could have done with being repackaged about 25 years ago. So there's still quite a lot of stuff that's, um, that had issues. But we have also identified some really significant sites that were just previously just unknown. We have this Roman villa that is um, it's probably a nationally important Roman villa that was excavated by a community archaeology group in the early 90s. And the extent of any public knowledge about it is two lines in historic environment record. And it's huge. And there's a huge amount of material about uh, from it. So we are finding these things that people just don't know about. Um, but this, this villa could have been cited in, in all sorts of different things as a comparison. But um, no one, how would you know it exists if there's no information about it? So that's partly what we're, our next task is to try and do, to try and publicize some of this. Um, and we have um, archives such as Ashton Roman Town, which is a massive um, Roman, well, it's the suburbs of Roman Town with the cemetery that's also unpublished. So there's loads of material in the county that hasn't been published and has a lot of opportunity for researchers. Um, and then public access. So, I felt like I had to paraphrase um, Field of Dreams. Build it and they will come. So, um, over, we've had over double the amount of researchers accessing our collections in the last 10 months or so than the previous 12 years combined. And it's probably longer than that. That, that number is based off of um, the amount of PhD students who are accessing North Ants collections in the recent report by Universities UK, um, but we've more than doubled that, and also had a lot more local researchers as well accessing the collections. But it probably, that's, it's probably more than the last 25 years combined. So it does show that when this, is, when this material is available, it 
it is actually used. Um, this is a, a student from the University of Newcastle doing PXRF on one of the uh, Chester Bowls, which we found about 200 metres away from where the ark is actually situated. Um, of those archives, we've had around about 900 boxes actually be looked at by a researcher. Uh, primarily, this was by two researchers who did a lot of work on human remains and looked through hundreds of boxes, which really is great for padding the stats. But um, yeah, but it's, it's great because it does show that this material is actually getting used. And as I said, we had um, volunteers doing tours of the, the art, um, and we've had tours for around about 1,400 people since we opened. Um, it's possibly a little bit more than that, actually. Um, and that's been a mixture of me doing tours and our volunteers doing it once we turned them up. Um, and that's been really good because that's meant that we've been able to reach a non-specialist audience. And most of those tours take an hour, an hour and a half. But we're actually able to introduce them to some really interesting archaeology, many of whom there's people living on top of where there was archaeology. So, uh, for example, we have this massive housing estate in Hind Ferris, just down the road from where where we're situating, we've had, I think, four or five tours where people who live in that housing estate actually had no idea there was a Roman shrine in a Middle Saxon village underneath where they lived. And that's been really good because it's actually, you know, it's their archaeology, really. And one of those has actually come back to have a proper look around stuff. So it's really good to have that as a spark of what people's actual interest is. And we did notice there was a real uptick after there was two Northamptonshire sites and a site from Rutland on TV in the same week, and then we suddenly had loads of interest, which was really good. Um, and we've also had loans go out for displays. So none of these have gone to museums, but um, there's been two sort of heritage slash nature sort of centres where we've had two pop-up displays. One at Stanick Lakes, where there was a, a major Roman villa that was excavated, and also um, one at Delafray Abbey, which is in Northampton. So we've had some objects going out. That's something we want to improve on. So that's sort of where we've been for the last year, um, but I should sort of say of where we want to go. Um, so we want to expand our team, because currently it's just me, and I've just got permission that we can recruit an assistant, so if anyone's interested, come and talk to me. Um, that we also need to finish emptying the legacy stores. Um, so we've got around about 7,000 boxes of archives to still collect. I think it's around that. Um, there's around 4,500 of those from one particular store. Um, but the rest is all the stuff stored by archaeological units or community archaeology groups that we want to slowly bring into the, into the art. Um, but I suspect that will take at least two years. As some of the stuff from archaeological units will take longer than that. Um, we also want to really develop further volunteering opportunities because we have this great bank of volunteers um, and they have picked up things really, really well. But it's also about improving their experience. Um, so we've got a group of volunteers currently working through our human remains and they're being trained by a volunteer um, who is an osteologist so that's been really really helpful so they've been getting training from that uh, but also maybe getting workshops in where they could look at Roman pottery getting a specialist in to come and do that uh, medieval pottery to try and improve their skill set and try and engage them better with the archaeology that they're looking at um, but it's, it's also I should have said it's been really rewarding the work of the volunteers in terms of we've had people saying things like it's been really good for their mental health because they've been able to come in and actually talk to other people. This we timed this so it was sort of just after a lockdown and that was really it was a really big thing to it. So I was like I was amazed by that. I thought, oh it's archaeology, it's just you know, old stuff. But people were really happy about the social element of it. Um, and also, yeah, we want to, so we want to expand on that. And we also want to be able to support the community archaeology groups in the county better with archiving and helping them with post and stuff. Um, and we also um, need to continue working to improve our collections. So as I said, we've got around 4,000 boxes of archives that probably could have been sorted better about 25 years ago. So there's a lot of work that we need to do. There's huge conservation issues. So that is, that's one of the primary things we need to sort so that this stuff is actually usable in you know, 10 years, let alone 25 years' time. Um, and we also want to get start properly cataloguing things on, on our database, because um, we haven't really been able to do that yet. But that's hopefully going to start from um, 2023 onwards, really. Um, and then we also want to continue promoting the use of our collections. We've been able to, so, and it's not just to academics, it's to, to um, non-academics and local people as well. So we've had, um, I think, students from seven universities come and access our collection so far. And what's been really good is then you've had a second student from that university. Because they know now we are accessible, 
it's able to say, oh, well, if you, you know, go and access this material. So that's been really good, but it's trying to get it out there, so we need to have a bit of a think about how we can promote that. But then also to non-academic audiences, for local people to actually understand how significant some of the archaeology is underneath their feet. Um, particularly in the area where the ark is located in Urchester, we've got the Roman town, but there's been a huge amount of development on the, along the River Men, or River Mean if you're in a different part of the, the county. Um, but along this part of the river, there's huge amounts of um, excavations from gravel quarry and housing developments, and a lot of people just have no idea that it was there, and it's really important. But there's definitely an interest in history, it's just not knowing where to go and look for it. Um, so that's one of the, that's a really key thing for us, um, and also we'd like to try and get the start. Um, we've got a learning program as part of the Chester House Estate, trying to integrate the archives better into that. So doing things like loans boxes, but also when we've got a school group from say Kettering, we can actually show them stuff from Kettering, so not just stuff from Manchester. Um, and then finally, we would like to get um, Arts Council England Museum accreditation, and that's not just the Ark on its own. That's the whole Chester House Estate of which the Ark is part of. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of what we're planning to do. And, um, yeah, I will just say thank you. And finally, I've got a shameless plug. We've inherited around about 800 boxes of archives from other counties. Um, pretty much every county in the country is represented in this assemblage. Um, Leicestershire, the lovely people from Leicestershire have already taken the stuff from Leicestershire. Thank you, guys. Um, but we do have pretty much, uh, we actually have some stuff from France. So, if anyone knows how you deposit archives in France, please come and tell me. But we do have this material, so if any curators, and I know there's plenty of you in this room, are interested, please come and talk to me. Um, but yeah, so thank you for your time, and um, yeah, any questions? Sure.